Hi. Hello. How are you? Welcome. It's so great to see all of you. Thank you for coming to, uh, to visit with me. I'm Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. Um, well, I was the first person of color to graduate from the Rhode Island School of Design uh, in 1918. You call it RISD now. It's, it's a cute name. <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness. I wanted to come back. I decided to come back because I want to have salons and, and meet with people who appreciate, love art. And here we are, all the right people. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to be in this wonderful place. I understand that this is an art colony that uh, this wonderful man, Bert Krenka, put together and worked on and just developed the whole thing and uh, lots of things going on here and I'm delighted and honored to be here. Thank you, Bert Krenka. Uh, I think that's you because I've seen pictures of you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I'm here uh, because uh, for, for, for a few reasons uh, <clears throat> beside my own. Uh, one is at the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities which is very interested in all these sorts of things, uh, made it possible for um, a young lady, Sylvia Ann Soares, to become friends with me and to uh, bring me, carry me around to different places. I, yeah, I did say young lady because actually she's very much younger than I would be if I were here right now. So. <laughs> And, and I'm going to try to keep her alive as long as I can because I'm having a good time with everything. Um, well, I graduated from RISD and actually uh, before a little bit before that time I had been working. Uh, oh, I am from Warwick. I'm from Arctic. Well, we say Arctic. Yes, I'm from Arctic. I was, uh, came into this world in 1890. Uh, it was a mill town. And I was told as a child, as I was drawing and doing all my things, that, that you know, this is not going to work. Uh, you weren't going to make any money on this, and you should go and work in the mills or become a teacher. And, but I wanted to be an artist. I am an artist. <laughs> so, but I did work some domestic work, and then there was some stenographer. I trained a stenographer and worked at that for a while. Uh, and I uh, was living up on Benefit Street after I graduated. Um, <clears throat> actually, it's still there. The house is still there. It said uh, 62 Benefit, Benefit and Star. And um, I had started doing portrait painting um, and because I, I did study uh, mechanical painting and design and a little bit of architecture and, and, and a number of things at RISD, but I started doing portrait painting to see if I could bring in a few pennies well, that wasn't really working well, and uh, at some point, someone, uh, uh, and I, which will remain unnamed, um, an organization offered me an exhibit with one stipulation. Does any can anyone guess what that is? That I not be there at opening. That I not stand beside my work. They did not want to see this person in their gallery. So I went to Paris. Well, anyway, let me, let me read to you from the diaries at Paris. And I, I've written uh, these, uh, I wrote these after the experience uh, because I wanted to make sure you got the experience and we're going to experience it. Uh, let me read some to you. August 11th, 1922, I was 32 years old when I went to Paris. Arriving in Paris on the day of August 11, 1922, with $380. Having engaged a studio at 36 Avenue de Châtillon, I went immediately to bed, being in a very run-down condition, having worked so hard to earn the money to get here. And what with all the worry and disgust with the kind of work I was obliged to do being in America, I was bitter and hurt. I'd saved $1,000 to come with, loaned half of it to a worthless brother, thus after paying my passage and other expenses, my fortune was reduced to $380. I was in bed nearly two months, 
I was so weak I could hardly walk down the stairs to go out from time to time to get food to eat. And Mabel Gardner, whom I'd known in America, had a studio in the court. I'd hoped that we could be friends. But she hated me the moment we met, so I closed the door on her and decided to stay to myself. She's a person who's sick with envy. Out of pure weakness, I wrote my husband to come over. And this was a very stupid mistake on my part. <laughs> you know, he being a good man, but completely helpless, without ambition, without hope, character, personality, and a fearful nature. Two people instead of one in a strange land, living on $380, neither speaking the language. Well, as soon as I could stand up, <laughs> I went to work, sick, but with a dogged determination to conquer. I worked away on my first piece of sculpture with a calm assurance and savage pleasure of revenge. I remember how sure I was that it was going to be a living thing, a master stroke. How my arms felt as I swung them to put on a piece of clay. I was conscious of the great rhythm as they swung through the air. They seemed so long and powerful. <laughs> Two months, just mornings, and then all day for about a month, I worked. This over two weeks without food. Well, there was a humorous side to this period. Uh, I was not working in my own studio, um, but in that of a young French woman who lived in the court who became interested in my ability and asked me to share her studio, here being much better lighted. And most of the time she was not there as she was a student at L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts. She had a dog and one morning as she left the studio, I stole a piece of meat and potato from the plate of the dog, who ate very well. And this I ate ravenously. For the first time in my life, I was hungry. But this seemed of little importance to finishing the bust. You know, it was very interesting to feel how I felt each day. My mind was very clear. I could think with great ease, though my belt was always dropping down around my feet. And though I shared this young woman's studio, I had no desire to be intimate or take her into my confidence. And through pride, I kept my state of affairs from her. When she was present, she kept up a gay chattering and laughter, in which I did my best to take part in, but how empty I felt at times. And before this period, she used to have tea at five o'clock. There were no cakes or tea during these two weeks. Well, at last I decided to cast the bust working all day, going to bed about two o'clock in the morning, awakening in the morning with dizzy head and swimming eyes. The next evening, a woman came to call who I had seen but once before. She asked me to go out and dine with her. I accepted, saying that I would gladly go since I had not eaten in two weeks. She looked at me with great surprise and we went out to dine. During dinner, she invited me to come and live with her as she was alone and lonely, offered to give me a small allowance that I should come in to Paris to my studio each morning to work. She lived in Versailles. I accepted. She was anxious to persuade me to leave the man I'd married since he was unfit to do anything for me. This I was not ready to do and saw him each day. I stayed with Ellen Barrows three months when we quarreled. She wanted me for the attraction of men. I left her. I entered L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts and began work there with Ségaufin. <laughs> the man I married was given a position with a small wage. I had moved to another studio in the meantime and it was the proprietor who found him a position. I cut the bust in wood and the following year, it was accepted 
in the Salon d'Automne, 1924. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and since I have been cautiously working uh, with very little to do with, but making people's busts who would pose without pay. Summer, 1925, I was ill from overwork, difficult living conditions, malnutrition. I was unable to stand up. My legs would collapse if I tried to. I had not had a full night's sleep for over a year. Continued to go to the school to Beaux Arts and to cut stone in my own studio in the afternoon. And I'd also begun making batik with the hope of making some money. By this time, I had moved three times and was living in the zone in a little shack, a filthy low section just outside the walls of Paris. Well, there was a garden about 600 meters square. I raised vegetables for food, doing all the planting and cultivating myself, all the summer vegetables for summer and also the winter ones for winter. But then I broke down being by myself all day, growing weaker and weaker each day. An acquaintance learned of it, encouraged me to go to the American hospital, much against my will. As soon as I arrived, the American doctors began to insist that I was a drug addict, and the nurses treated me as one. I stayed there three weeks. Regular eating and rest made it possible for me to stand on my feet and ask to be allowed to leave. They let me go, but told me that if I tried to go to work in less than a year, I should be back again in two weeks. As I returned to my shack in the zone, all the horror of its poverty struck me, and I was unable to stay there any longer. I sold some batik, and a woman gave me 2,000 francs. I took a studio in Rue Vessingeterix, which was to sublet for six months. I began my first life-size statue. <laughs> Volonté. <laughs> I was happy to begin work, and I worked all day long. Though at times I was obliged to stop and rest as my leg kept going back on me, and I, I had strong nervous attacks as I came to the studio with an attempt to leave my husband. November 11th, 1925. Having gone out to look for a studio and by chance finding a man who's going to construct Paul Bautier, 147 Rue Broca. I await Sunday with impatience for knowledge of pr prices and final decisions. If that studio becomes mine, it will be my first real studio in Paris. For during these three years, I've been constantly moving about, living on all sorts of conditions. The zone, before that, a place where there was no toilet, no gas, and the water trickled down the walls and froze in the wintertime. Many hours I sat on that couch in that cold, wet studio trying to collect myself together. Other places where there were public toilets in that court, they were so filthy, I could not enter them. I, I tried, but each time they raised my stomach. Often I did not bathe regularly. It was so cold and I was so torn down with melancholia and worry always over money. November 17th. This morning, working away on the head of a man who I picked up in a cafe, working with the most delicious sensation of rightness, feeling harmonic accord of my forces, which I have been trying for years to attain. November 27th, beginning my second life-size statue. Well, I arose fairly early. 
I began to scan the studio. Uh, it, what a miserable place for a real model. So I bustled about and trying to scrape up the dirt and trying to make it a more fit setting for her. My work looked too poor for her to see. Uh, you know, I, I hid different things under clothes. The model arrives at two. A model I thought for a master. She was really very ugly. December 8th, the man I married coming to see me with a great bunch of roses. <laughs> there he lies on the couch now, asleep. Oh, God. Oh, God, he came drunk. December 21st, I pray that I may never become the victim of envy and jealousy. These two low qualities bring nothing but destruction to the soul. Envy is a result of a poverty-stricken soul. December 22nd, cutting stone. How I love working alone. I feel so much in contact with myself. December 23rd, you're welcome to keep your body. I would rather have my mind and my soul. I can appreciate the primitive beauty of a hippopotamus, but I like not his humanized descendants. December 24th, who am I and what? I feel so terribly alone. December 25th, Christmas Eve. March 2nd, 1926. Going off again to call the city of Paris for a studio as my time here has expired. Uh, Rue Vessingetrix. Uh, there's certainly a studio in Paris. March 4th, Paul Bourdieu promises me a studio which he'll build for the payment of a year's rent in advance for a thousand francs. I borrowed the money. And in the night, puzzling angel placed her hand on my head and said, go on. April 3rd, the soul of me, let me not waver or lose courage. April 4th, Easter, how sad and lonely it seems. Yet, to think alone and in silence is beautiful. Not to be holy oneself is death to the soul. April 6th, is there anything more pitiful than a feeble brain trying to function or contemplations? And two pieces of work have been cast and I'm ashamed of them both. What, which makes me understand how seriously I must work for my self-development if I do not wish, to, not always, to be ashamed of my things. April 16th, there's one mode of conduct when with a fool, and that is to be a fool. Oh, it is a wish to leave him. April 22nd, the intelligent thing is not to complicate that which is simple, but simply simplify that which is complicated. I see people floundering and pondering over things that are absolutely open and clear, trying to make a mystery of them. This is purely a lack of understanding. That which we understand becomes simple and clear, and that which we fail to understand appears complicated and mysterious. April 30th, I have smashed up La Volonté. <sighs> I must not be guilty of doing with my work as I have formerly too often done with people, trying to imagine there's good and overlook the false when in truth there is not enough to make a thing worthwhile. May 2nd, arriving in Normandy for a short stay while the studio is being completed.
May 3rd, lying on the beach. Le Cotoy, oh, so beautiful, all quiet, wonderful solitude. <laughs> what a weak thing. I've been wishing for people when I have been given the ability to think. <laughs> June 4th, 1926. Here I sit in a poor little apartment, still waiting for the studio while it drags along. So hungry to work that it seems that I must go completely insane. My head is full of ideas, a fever to execute. All day long I have to sit here quietly thinking and planning. From time to time my eyes are forced to fall on a gas stove in the corner, coal stove against the wall and a squalid sink in the middle of these two, which is embellished by a faucet with a rubber end that seems ready to squirt at any instant. It's like a penis on the wall. The bedroom is next, with a great mahogany wardrobe with a beautiful glass, while the walls are lined with bed bugs. Another little mirror in the kitchen. <laughs> These two mirrors reflect me, my work hungry self. Otherwise, the place suggests nothing but to cook and clean and the poverty of my situation. Oh, poverty, the curse of genius. June 26, installed at last in my beautiful new studio after changing the color of the walls from a howling yellow to a cool gray green and with poverty now begun, I now feel at home. <laughs> July 8th. to be assailed by desire, which I will not give away to or cannot without losing self-respect for myself. And the anguish of these three days lack work, that is not enough to be obliged to fight against this thing that seems to be eating into my very entrails and dividing my thoughts in spite of my efforts against him. Oh, ho, oh, oh, desire, what a commanding force you are. How strong nature has made you. You come without love, unmasked, unwished. When I think you're dead and sleeping, you come rushing in with great strength, having been but in repose. July 16th. My days are spent with work, but faltering with melancholy and nights of struggling without sleep. All my effort is exerted in trying to bring about harmonic action of my forms. This I try for hourly, minutely, and yet each day I seem to be farther off from what I do. I am the judge of my own works, that at best I am capable of, for my idea or the vision and the execution of it are constantly side by side. There's no chance of a mistake for the one never approaches the other. July 20th, why jest, laugh with fools only to be saddened and ashamed of oneself when left alone? July 26th, uh, three days, I felt something is taking possession of me. Today, I have a peculiar sense of having been emptied of something. There, there is a loss. What is it? Evening comes, and quiet thought. The little stars for people have gone. Is this the loss? I, I feel a cold, calm indifference and an acceptance of a truth. There will be no more disappointment. I must grow now to be worthy of the real souls who I shall meet when I am ready. We are great and beautiful. 
in proportion to the greatness and beauty we are capable of putting into our work and vice versa. Sunday, August 29th. Work. I'm up at five. I have changed my clothes, putting on a lovely green silk dress, <laughs> feeling gay and well. <laughs> I sit on the couch, cheerily feeling myself among the people in the setting I so much love. <laughs> Beauty, understanding, and uh, uh, harmony of thought and feeling. Yes. <laughs> And there comes a feeling of sadness, of desolate loneliness. How joyful it would be if these voices, these faces, these rugs, these hangings would but speak aloud and show themselves instead of but misty, formless things created and living only in my imagination. I sit here to love, to relax, in just this hour that I wish it. The thing began at my feet, and it has crept up to my neck and soon will cover my head. Oh, God, the smothering blanket of reality. September 19th. How swiftly the happy days slip by. <laughs> It's only the two unhappy ones that linger and drag. Almost a month has fled, a month of battles fought and won with all the glory that comes with success. Days of spiritual freedom, days of harmony in body and soul, days when the body was healthy and heard, days of passion and desire, days of sadness and joy, days of laughter and tears, days of tears, Nights of sweet sleep and pleasant awakening. Days of plenty, days of want. Poverty, detestable poverty. How you trail behind me, ever screeching out your presence. Think you to ever make me a subject of your kingdom? Never. Though I die of hunger, I shall never bend the knee to your majesty, for I am not of your race. And yet what new phases of poverty are there for me to learn? <laughs> Going without eating? It's common to regain my health and strength, only to lose it through fasting. It comes as a periodical occurrence so frequent that it neither interests or frightens me. Poverty. Weary not yourself in trying to humiliate me. Sometimes the face of life is but a mocking lie. Poverty, your grace, I accept your challenge. October 23rd, Persephone continues to pose without pay. <laughs> November 16th. In these struggles, not to lose that which is best in me, to take that which life sends me, to seek and absorb its essence, and to grow strong thereby. <laughs> November 20th. Ah, oh, roses. De Noel, <laughs> sweet gift from a friend of humble origins. How touching is your love in this hour of scarceness and hardness. <laughs> November 22nd, the bust is done. Sitting on a pedestal covered with black cloth, draped in marring to hide it from my own eye that seeks so much a beautiful thing and it is not there to have worked and then learned that I have been guided by delusion. December 30th, two 
have been a woman once. January 6th, love, the genie of life, the creator of dreams, spoiler of action, the death of will, worker of masterpieces, renders of peace, givers of sorrow, pride, happiness, terror, sublime. January 29th, this morning, as I awakened, the studio was filled with a strange, rosy light. I jumped out of bed and ran to the window, and there, across the heavens, stretched in marvelous length, a joyous rainbow. It was there but a moment, and then gone. <laughs> May 6th, God, loan me thy puissance for a dozen years. May 14, 1927. To have seen a working man, tired, worn, standing at the bar of a cafe after a day's work done, drinking his aperitif, clutched in his hand a small bouquet of white flowers, hard-soiled hands that matched the loose velvet breeches and clumsy sabots. <laughs> June 7th. Letter written to Louise W. Brooks. <clears throat> My dear Miss Brooks, Mabel Gardner has told me of your love and interest in sculpture and what you and she are trying to do for it through me, I've decided to write to you myself, uh, something I'm afraid I should hesitate to do uh, were not circumstances pressing me too cruelly. Um, also, Mabel G. writes, she's the first person I've met who understands and is so spirited, and this gives me courage I can write to you as though I were writing myself. I want to work. This is no vain idea that I'm favoring myself with, no distraction through which I seek to make life more agreeable and time pass more quickly, but a fire that burns in me, a force which compels my obedience, and I am only obeying a command which is stronger than myself, even in the face of what may seem discouraging conditions. I cannot stop. I must go on. Someday people will realize that this is my medium of expression, that it is still possible to say something through sculpture that a sculptor may let live again. I do not complain of difficulties. I'm not afraid to face them. A contraire, I know that each one of life's problems I am able to overcome makes me bigger and richer for my work. I, I like to match myself with life's forces this thing, money, and lack of it is too crushing. It keeps me from working when I should be expressing that which I learned from each day lived. It staggers me, it, it sickens me. I try to live as I believe honorable and worthy of my work, not to hurt myself, thus hurting the work, and still this crushing difficulty. It is almost most hard to understand, for it seems always to be the same. It has no varied sides, but a grim monotone sameness. All else changes but for this. It neither varies itself nor leaves me. Now, I am a fighter, determined and non-retreating. I stop only when I drop. It is an inheritance of mine. And yet, though I am not wavering or undecided, this thing has become sordid, gruesome, for it seems not to call for a square fight. <laughs> Perhaps I lack what it calls for. I must continue to work. People like my things, and if they like them, shall I someday not be able to care for myself? I want to. I expect that of myself. Shall respect myself more when I can, but at this moment I seem not to be able to, and I'm sad, almost ashamed to ask. 
Sculpture is an expensive medium, I know, but I have not chosen my medium of expression. It has chosen me. What more can I say? I want to work. I want to work. I must work. I live for that alone. Forgive me, I, I beg you for writing like this, for I am driven to desperation. Elizabeth Prophet. Through this letter to Louise W. Brooks, Miss Laura Heathfield, her secretary, secured for me from the Students Fund of Boston $30 a month for two years. It stopped as suddenly as it began at that time without warning. June 10th, 1927. To have glimpsed the secret of power. November 15th, through the hunger and yearning of the soul is the work of art. January 28th, hunting for beauties of paradise in the midst of living hell. January 15, how quiet and lonely the world. Like some dusky raven weighing through the night with a gruesome graveyard to cheer his appetite. Long after dawns the morning with mocking clear blue sky. Mental and spiritual strength is greater through the physical. To genius, each hour, each minute we live must be registered on the record of time. So beautifully lived, so powerfully lived that this whole human race for centuries without limit to come may look thereon and find no shameful trace, no violation of God's laws, no mutilation of the sacred creed of beauty every divine faculty developed to its highest cultural extent. February 18th, the true work of art is a creation, not of the hands, but of the mind and the soul of the artist. He who loves and seeks beauty must acquire the power to produce it from within. He would have perfection must attain that quality in his own creation. Live for this and ask no more. To attain this, one must seek as instructor the great universal creator for there. Only there is the true power to command and create from all that comes within the range of thought, feeling, and vision. The family is the embryo of the nation. Genius is cursed with loneliness. February 20th, starvation. February 30th, beauty is conceived in paradise, but formed in the depths of hell. May, 10, starvation. May 29th, 1929. I will not bend an inch. April 10, the man I marry leaves for America. I was able to send him away at last with the help of a piece of sale of my work. This represents an epoch in my life, a greater strength obtained. May 29th, my first piece of work is sent to Salon des Artistes Francaises and accepted. <laughs> August 13th, let yourself flow easily culture of mind and soul. That is the secret of growth. To speak badly a language is to commit a crime. <clears throat> October 29th, arriving in America to show some of my work with the hope of selling, 
April 4th, discontent, head of in wood was sold for $1,000 from the 56th Street Gallery. It was bought by Miss Ellen D. Sharp and Miss Eleanor B. Green, presented and accepted by the Museum of Rhode Island School of Design for its permanent collection. August 22nd, back in Paris <clears throat> with $500. November 30th, 1930. Oh, delicious and a solitude, adorable solitude. How you soothe and calm the soul. Otto Kahn, who made extravagant phrases arousing a pernicious hope and did nothing. <laughs> December 25th, $5 for Christmas for Margarita L. Dwight. <laughs> March 1st, 1931, penniless again. July 14th, Went to see Revue Militaire to Versailles in the evening. Cannon practice, green trees. Entered at 10. Yes, it's good to be alone. December 17, night that hides the sorrow of the lonely. Peace and calm that soothes the tortured soul. December 18. Voici la vie dans toute sa beauté et tragédie, tous ses désappointements et tous ses désespoirs. Life in all its beauty and tragedy, all its disappointments and despairs. April 24th, sweet death, the lover of weary souls. May 2nd. Harlem night where there is no light. Transition from Paris to the sordid filth of Harlem. May 18th, arriving in America for the second visit. June 2nd, 1932. Tea with Mrs. Edward H. Charles. Received news of acceptance as a member of the Art Association of Newport. June 18th, guest to Miss R.G. Moore Brown. June 20th, lunch with Miss Agnes C. Stora at the home of the Sisters of the Holy Ghost. July 1st, guest to Miss Stora, visit Art Association, meet Mrs. Elliot, was stirred by her beauty and energy. July 3rd, met Mrs. Emily Post, saw her Carmelite chapel, with wonder and admiration, I gazed at Emily Post. July 8th, attending the reception for the opening of the exhibition of the Art Association of Newport. My reception was joyous and frank and wholehearted. I was given the grand prize. <laughs> oh, July 24th, waiting with great anxiety for sale. August 6th. Mr. Schuyler L. Parsons presents me and my work to his friends and acquaintances of the Newport Summer Colony. Congolais, head in wood, sold to Mrs. Harry Payne Whitney for the museum collection. November 1st, 1932, Boston Show with Robert C. Bowes Gallery. November 3rd, 1933. Winter begins with the usual lack and worry. Silence in all regions. I await the month of March for the grant or the refusal of the Guggenheim Fellowship. Being hounded by the preceptor for the payment of import tax, I made a visit to the Minister de Beaux-Arts to avoid Kino seizure. November 25th, visit from the police through Minister de Beaux-Arts. November 28th, 
invitation from Minister de Beaux-Arts to present myself for a small encouragement, small sum of money, $300, which I'd received from Minister de Finance. If I'd get a million francs, I should not be more happy and encouraged. Jean Chaton, my proprietor, concierge, puts in some coal for me. And up to this time, I have not had heat in my studio. Chantôme is feeding me and heating my studio on credit for the winter. November 30th, Thanksgiving Day. Dear Julia Champion, coming surprise with many food things for a Thanksgiving feast. Février. 1934, slow, difficult, anxious winter. At the end of February, I began tearing down the partitions of my studio, uh, which enclosed a small corner where I slept and eaten and thought and rested for these nine years. The proprietor having rented to me the small studio upstairs. This I shall use for living quarters, keeping the whole of downstairs space for my work alone. This means at least a bit of quiet to think and work after nine years of complete hellish bedlam going on over my head all day and all night made by lowest kinds of brutes and debauchee. March 30th, received the refusal of the Guggenheim Fellowship. I continue making over my studio to overcome the seriousness of this how I'm working from six in the morning until midnight on the studio, putting on two coats of paint on all the walls from floor to ceiling, all the wooden partitions I've sawed up and split up for the winter. I am 10,000 francs in debt to Madame Chanton, my proprietor. April 9th, Madame Chanton loans me 5,000 francs. I pay a few outside bills and proceed with the studio installation and, 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 and plumbing. And, May 5th. I'm sitting in my little study upstairs. It's quite charming and restful. It's practically complete. I'm going on. Where? Money. I have also begun a large statue, Le Prince Sublime. It is just defiance. May 6th, 1934, to dine with Edouard and Julia Champion. They're frightened at my destitute condition. Their friendship is withdrawn. I understand too well my situation is too difficult. May 14th, life is so long. June 3rd begins zero cents diet. June 16th, a gift of a lovely velvet wrap. How soft to the touch, raspberry in color. How pleasing to the eye, buttons set with hillens. Oh, how coquettishly they sparkle. <laughs> Package of tea, a jar of fruit, orange marmalade. <laughs> How enticing to an empty stomach. No, no meat, no bread. These things awaken appetite. They recall a stomach which was almost forgotten. How easy it seems to forget self. I long, longer seem to care. But how ironical. It's June 19th. After a time, one can reach a point where just to caress and gaze upon a lovely velvet wrap can and must become nourishment. June 21st, orange marmalade and tea make a bad diet. July 1st, 1934, Mario and his sister Irma plan to provide me with nourishment, a good nourishing dinner. July 9th, D. 
dinner with Miss Gray, Shala Irma, with much embarrassment, informs me that there is no food or money. <coughs> July 19, since July 1st, one meal with Miss Gray, walking to Mont Rouge and back, rent paid the 15th, Madame Julia Champion loaning me the money on my request for the whole sum. I feel well and calm. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I am so excited to have been making friends, <laughs> new friends at a different time. I, there were a few things before. You might have some questions, but I know you need a little time to. Um, and, and there were these surveys that this uh, uh, Rhode Island Council for the Humanities wants to know. And they want to tell the larger people that doing these things and, and actually allowing me to come through and come and be with you is worth doing or not. Or whatever you feel. Not a test. Not an essay, just any word you want. And if you want to receive some of their information, put your email or your address and things down um, for that. Um, <clears throat> I did, in 1934, uh, I was uh, invited to teach at Spelman um, at the um, invitation and the suggestion of W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a friend, and John Hope, who was the head of um, Atlanta University, and at that time they formed Atlanta University, Morehouse, and Spelman College. When he became president, he formed a, a consortium of those schools. So I ended up teaching at both Atlanta and Spelman. Um, I, at first I took the job, and then I went to Paris, and then someone called from Paris, and I went, and it all fell through. And, but they were very nice to take me back. Now, my sculpture, there's a booklet being passed around, which, um, can someone just share it and pass it around, uh, which has some of my sculpture in it, and um, a lot, much of it, I was unable to afford to bring it from Paris, so uh, it was, there's an alleyway and a place where we all lived uh, with, that are filled with crumbled statues and sculpture with people who, you know, either didn't work out or they couldn't bring it, and why should it remain and have someone else make it? Uh, and, and some of my things here were left out and were not rescued, so they're, they're not here anymore. Um, there were some things left in Spelman, and uh, if, oh, I, I left and did not have the finances to, uh, to uh, transport them here when I came back to Providence, and over time they were just not understood as to what they were, who they were, belonged to, and um, so those are no longer available. Um, there was a place on Broad Street, I, Things have changed so much, but I believe Broad Street is that way, yes. Uh, it was way up on Broad Street. Um, <clears throat> a tenement house, and I had an apartment there and kept some things in the attic and worked there a bit. Uh, there was a, an antique shop on the first floor, and a woman um, had some of my things. Uh, I became ill, and I was not able to, to go and get them. And um, at some point in time, they tell me she moved or something, and they tell me that um, later on, there was a hospital there, St. Joseph's Hospital was on that corner, where they decided that they wanted to have a parking lot. And so they tore the house down, and my, some of my things were there. However, the woman of the antique store had uh, a niece, and she gave her one of my pieces. And you can see it, actually. In fact, you can see a few more of them. Um, well, not all of them, but, but a, a couple of them, and some very other interesting things about me. At the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society Gallery, and that's in, in the rear of the John Brown House. Uh, there's a wonderful gallery there. They have a, a cabinet with this is display. Uh, Rob Dimmick and Ray Rickman um, put this thing together. It's called Delicious Sensations. They call it Sensations. <laughs> 
of Rightness. It'll be there until the end of June. You can see it in the afternoon, free at the John Brown House. It's a beautiful exhibit. And um, I suggest that you uh, take us, go by and, and bring a little lunch and then sit outside of that, it's a, that beautiful place and yard, um, uh, lawn, I'm sorry, and, <laughs> and enjoy that. Um, yeah, so is there something else? Um, someone have any questions or, or statements or whatever? Yes, this is Holly from the John Hay Library, yes? Yes, I, I just mentioned a little bit of that um, earlier on. Um, yeah, for a while, it was after I had gotten out of high school, and then I, I had to, to uh, when I was going to RISD, um, earn some money. And so there were no, I couldn't get, there were no jobs. And I had to work part-time. Sometimes I worked at, you know, on the east side with um, families if they had parties, and sometimes I worked uh, full-time as a domestic. Um, there was also a time when I did, as I said before, I did, uh, was studying, um, not studying, uh, after RISD, um, that I was working as a stenographer. Um, so, um, but I, that was not enough money. You could not earn enough money as a domestic. I did not like those jobs at all. I did not like the way I was treated. And, and I, I, I just wanted to d do my work, is what I wanted to do. And uh, people looked at me when I said I was, you know, an artist, and they were just, well, that's very nice, dear. Um, president Radeke, who was a female president of RISD at that time, and she offered me some support, um, financial support, so I, I couldn't earn that money as a domestic to, to go through that school. Um, and a little later on, um, Gertrude Whitney, who was um, interested in my work, um, offered me some support. But there were, you, you know, people couldn't take me on as full burden, and uh, I don't know exactly what was, what the, you know, the situation at that time, um, my being who I am, um, that whether it wasn't, um, what do you call it? profitable to, to take me on or something, I, I, I don't know, as a, as a full-time. Um, uh, I received quite a bit of, uh, later on, well, I don't know how quite to say it, but people were, were trying to say that I did not want to be a Negro, as we called then, and, and forever, I guess. Uh, I'm. African American, as you could say now, and Narragansett Pequot. My grandmother, my father's mother, bought my grandfather, my father's father, out of slavery here. So I am a mixture of those things. 